I'm Tommaso Poggio, uh, introducing the speaker for today, uh, Center for Brains, Mind and Machines, a weekly seminar. And I'm very happy to introduce Alan Ewell. I met Alan the first time when he came as a postdoc at the Artificial Intelligence Lab back in 82, I think this was uh, almost 40 years ago. And uh, um, he was coming as a theoretical physicist in quantum gravity, having worked uh, with um, Steve Hawkins in Cambridge. Um, and um, was, he was one of, I would say, the first physicists moving to computer vision and uh, machine learning and AI, as I said, 40 years ago. Um, I'm proud that we, I'm a, the co-author of him of, of a few papers on the math of um, some aspects of comp computer vision, scale space, in fact. Um, he um, was also one of the very early members of the CBMM, attending the summer school um, because its uh, mission, his mission, his objectives are very much the same as the center of brains, minds and machines. And that is the science and the engineering of intelligence with science being the primary motivation. Um, Alan is uh, um, presently the Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Cognitive and Computer Science at Johns Hopkins. Uh, before go getting there, he was a professor at Harvard, a researcher at the Smith Catwell High Research Institute, and a full professor of statistics and computer science at UCLA. Um, it's good you're back on the East Coast, even if we can see you only virtually. Well, the floor is yours, Alan. Great to see you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Tommy, for that very kind introduction. Yes, it doesn't mean 40 years ago, but when I started getting interested in AI and not physics, I was extremely lucky to end up, perhaps by chance, at MIT, where I had people you know, I could work with the real experts like Tommy and get guided into the field really, really, you know, really efficiently. And it's a change from physics to AI. I, I'm really very happy I did. It's one of my, the best decisions in my life was to make that change and to move to MIT. I'm also delighted to be talking to, uh, you know, the Center for Brains, Minds and Machines because the philosophy behind it is exactly what really motivates me. And I, 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 I have the center as one of my, uh, you know, it's one of the things I admire and I keep trying to set up something like this at Hopkins at a, admittedly a somewhat smaller, smaller scale. Um, anyway, so um, what I'll talk about, the title, Compositional Generative Networks and Adversarial Examiners. And the real goal is to go beyond the limitations of current AI. So the talk is a little unusual because I'm trying to cover a lot of topics. Um, and I'm really trying to make four, four main points here. So technical details, you know, I'll sketch the, the methods, but there's a technical details that might rely, you know, rely a longer, you know, a longer discussion. So um, high level discussions on the limitations of current AI and vision. So, you know, despite the recent successes, you know, current AI systems have many limitations and there was need for much more fundamental research to overcome them. And not everything can be solved by using more data. You know, I'd be giving this type of talk to places often the computer vision or the machine learning community like Oxford, you know, last month. So I'm saying things that probably the computer vision people need to hear, but I think people at CBMM would probably take it for granted. Um, but, uh, you know, so I can shock computer vision researchers by telling them that AI systems are brittle, special purpose, you know, consume large amounts of energy, require lots of annotation, et cetera, and, you know, lack the robustness, flexibility, and enormous versatility of human intelligence. And so that led to questions about how can we develop vision algorithms that can overcome the limitations? And secondly, how can we test the performance? 
So testing the performance seems a really trivial question. You know, I never imagined when I started doing AI that I would even imagine writing a paper about how to test algorithms because I took it, you know, I wouldn't have thought it was a really interesting question, but I think it really matters. I think it's almost crucial to develop better, you know, having better ways of evaluating algorithms is crucial to getting algorithms that have better performance. Because at least in my area, getting papers accepted requires producing tables showing that your algorithm is better than everybody else and a whole range of different tests. And yet I think a lot of those tests are not very good and not necessarily fully meaningful. So the methods are evaluated by what I'll call standard performance measures. Um, and I'll get into that on the next slide. But it has given rise to a certain type of conservatism, which can make it hard to publish novel work and sometimes even novel data sets, quite different from the situation 40 years ago. Uh, you know, if we had the reviewers then that we have now, computer vision would never have got started, I think. So what do I mean by standard performance measures? Well, they require training and testing data set algorithms evaluating them by average case performance on finite size balanced annotated data sets, uh, BAD for short. Now, there are very good reasons for doing this. Um, you know, there's very good theoretical understanding, PAC theory, VC theory, and machine learning, and Tommy, you know, who's worked with Smell has contributed to that. So it makes a lot of sense. And it's been a very effective strategy, which has dominated vision and machine learning for over 20 years and has trapped, you know, taken us up to the good level that we are now. But it also has drawbacks because I think it strongly favors data-driven regression type methods. And I'm using the word regression to mean very general regression in the statistics sense, discrete, continuous variables, you know, it doesn't matter. It also biases researchers to work on problems for which annotated data sets exist. And it can lead to, um, the tyranny of data sets which favor established well-engineered algorithms. So that's, you know, you know, that's the state. Um, and there are certain problems with SPMs that people have known ever since data sets were created. You know, one is data sets are biased. Important events may be rare. Results on one data set may not transfer to different domains. 20 years ago, we did work on edge detection. There were two different data sets. You knew if you trained your edge detector on Salby, it didn't work on South Florida and vice versa. And also instead of average case performance, you might care about worst case performance. Now, those are all things that at least in computer vision, most people would generally agree on, at least the thoughtful people. But uh, we'd argue is that there's actually more underlying problem with SPMs which is basically that the set of images is not just infinite, but the set of visual scenes is also combinatorially complex. So it's hard and arguably impossible for a finite size data set to be representative of the real world, even for static images. Okay. I mean, you can be representative of part of it, but if you're going into a company, com uh, you know, complex situation, the size has to be very big. Um, has to be huge, so big that it's really, uh, you know, uh, you know, becomes almost impossible. So how can you test vision algorithms if you want to go beyond SPMs? So there are alternatives. These alternatives exist. People are doing them. Um, one of them is out of distribution testing. You train on one data set and you evaluate on data which has different statistical properties. And I'll return to that in you know, part of the technical work. Another is domain transfer. You train on one data set, you perform domain transfer to data from the second data set. Um, uh, for example, we actually did that 20 years ago before people actually were working on domain transfer, I realized, and I'll return to that later. Reduce training, training using small amounts of data, testing with a much larger data set. Um, also evaluating on multiple tasks, but only training on one. So you, you know, you train 
to detect an object using bounding box annotation, but you also find the boundary, find the parts and things like that. So we, we'd argue that all these things are good, but may not go far enough. And so the more extreme version, which I'm not sure I persuaded anyone in computer vision to do, but you know, at least I'm starting out to see if I can find a few people is that you should start testing algorithms in a somewhat different way by adversarial examiners, which probe for their weaknesses. So the sort of motto for this is sort of let your worst enemy test your algorithm. Um, an adversarial examiner selects the test images sequentially at runtime, where the selection can be based on the algorithm's response to the previous image. So you don't just sort of have a finite fixed data set of images that you're testing on. You allow uh, questions to be asked, changes to be made to the images, which can then enable you to, in principle, explore a combinatorial number of images. Um, there were two examples we had. These are, you know, those are not huge. One is a work by Michel Xu, where you identify model weaknesses with adversarial examiners. And another one I'll say a little bit more about is called patch attacks, where you, um, you know, where you can modify images in a way that's perceptible to humans, but which really hurts standard deep networks. And so a provocative way to think about it is, you know, that we know in machine learning, the idea is that you test with a random set of samples. You know, this is basically the main idea. On the other hand, if you think of high technologies like computer code or airplanes, you don't really do that. You, uh, you know, you identify the weak points of the algorithms. And this would also be similar to how a professor would test students. You know, you don't test students by asking them a random selected set of questions. You test them by asking a series of questions where each question depends on their answer to a previous question. And if you're a student, that's presumably how you test professors as well. So it's a question of thinking of whether now that we've got to a stage of having good algorithms, we should perhaps test them in a rather tougher type of manner, um, particularly if we want to have systems at work in the real world um, really reliably. So here's a way of introducing this sort of work from the point of view of computer graphics. You know, you can, of course, in principle, use computer graphics to systematically explore algorithm performance as you vary all the generative factors. So it's very trivial, for example, to construct a sofa, view it from different angles, and then test an algorithm that's, that's you know, 100% successful at finding sofas on ImageNet and finding that if you show the sofas from certain viewpoints, the performance of the ImageNet trained uh, system, you know, algorithm falls almost to zero, you know, because, hey, it's never really seen that viewpoint probably. Or you can modify the color and the deep network's never seen that color. You can go into Unreal Stereo. So, uh, you know, stereo algorithms have been around for ages. I think, you know, Mar Poggio 1976, you know, is one of the earliest and a lot of the algorithms are still based on that principle. But if you know stereo, you know that there are situations which would cause stereo to fail, you know, specularities, textualness, transparencies, disparity jumps. It's very hard to evaluate that on benchmark data sets because these are really painful to annotate. But uh, if you use computer graphics, you can, you, you know, you can generate these types of, um, of situations. You can modify specularity textualists, and you can systematically study how algorithms perform as you vary these types of factors. Now, however, this approach runs into problems because the number of variables for generating images can become huge. So in these two examples I showed, you could do exhaustive search and that worked over the two examples because the number of variables was small. You just had to vary, uh, you know, for viewpoint, you vary three variables for color, two variables, et cetera. Very easy to do, quite practical. Um, differentiation, you know, local differencing, 
Well, you can do that. We did it in the paper on adversarial attacks beyond the image space, um, but differentiation is only a rather short type of search. It doesn't really push you far enough. It only allows you to explore in the local neighborhood. Um, so then go back to think, what would your, you know, what could your worst enemy do if they wanted to break your algorithm? Um, you, it seems that the next step would to say, you should train a search policy on the data, which allows you to modify, pick your next image based on the response of the algorithm to a previous image. How you do this, you know, can be done. In this case, we did reinforcement learning. You could do it with any other method. But essentially, the key concept is learn a search policy and then apply that search policy to when you're testing the algorithm. So over here on the right, at the bottom, um, blue is what happens. Uh, you know, you, you, you're plotting the performance on the test data over the number of iterations, the number of uh, examples that you show to it. And blue is what happens if you just pick random examples, in this case, random examples from the viewpoint. And basically you keep on testing and you think your algorithm's doing pretty well because it survived all the random tests. However, if you have this adversarial examiner that is trained by search policy, it initially is sort of also sort of flailing around a bit like the random method, you know, it's sort of changing viewpoint, not making much difference, but at a certain point, it sort of locks on uh, to the problem, you know, to the difficulty of classifying some of these objects. And the difficulty is that for certain viewpoints, these objects look fairly similar. So after, so after a certain state, it suddenly realizes it and, can, you know, converges to, uh, you know, viewpoints for which performance is really, is really bad. Okay. So this is one example. Start out, try to get a policy that allows you to systematically manipulate the image um, in response to the performance of the algorithm. Here is another one that I'll, uh, I'll bring up and we'll come back to this later, is, you know, how about doing this on real images? You know, there are, of course, a whole lot of standard attacks people have done, uh, you know, for the last six years or so, where you have imperceptible changes to images, et cetera, using differentiation. Now, this is not what we're doing. Uh, these changes are going to be perceptible, but they're not going to affect human interpretation of the images at all in the slightest. So again, you have an, a search attack policy, uh, which is trained by reinforcement learning agent. It works by selecting texture dictionaries. These dictionaries have been obtained by using a, features extracted from a surrogate deep network, not one the one that you're going to attack. And then you sort of generate images that have these texture features. So these are not objects. They look like a sort of a, you know, a Picasso painting or a Pratt painting from the early 1900s. You know, they, they do look actually quite artistic in a way, um, but they are attempting to capture some sort of textureless property of the object. Okay, so then the agent can select one of these patches or, you know, a couple of them, put them into the image, move them around. It can see how well the deep network responds to them. And, um, and based on that, it can select a different type of patch and then move the patch, you know, and, or move the patch somewhere. So, the system allows the image, you know, it, it doesn't have a fixed data set of images to test on. It has a fixed basic set and a whole series of combinatorial number of operations you can do onto that set of images, which enable it to search over a far bigger input space. And this attack, uh, this type of process works very well. It has an attack success rate and this is a targeted attack. So the success occurs if it takes a t-shirt or a sweatshirt 
and turns it into a pretzel, you know, because the target is a pretzel, if it turns it into a, a fish, that would not be a success. So it's a target attack, it's black box, it knows nothing about the interior properties of the deep network. Um, so the success rate is so, you know, over 95% success. And if you analyze the attacks, it sort of generally supports the idea that the deep nets don't have a very detailed knowledge of the structure of the object, but they really work by recognizing large numbers sort of textures or, or appearance templates, um, which they have sort of memorized in some form. And so, you know, one aspect here is it's not just that the deep network thinks the thing is a sweatshirt, uh, you know, the sweatshirt is a pretzel, but it thinks that this sort of little thing here, which is a very abstract sort of cat thing, looks more like a pretzel than a real pretzel. Okay, so if I give these two, you know, a response I get to giving this sort of talk is, our adversarial examiners too, too, too tough. You know, perhaps the types of images they generate rarely or never occur in practice. You know, is this a bit like German over-engineering where you go away and work on something for 20 years and, you know, then somehow you find it's no good because somebody's done the same thing far, you know, far quicker. Um, I see there's a question or two up here. So, Okay, so can we build a systems not fooled by any of the adversarial examiners? What can we certify about it? Um, at the moment, the adversarial examiners are limited, so you can say they're robust to that type of examiner. But I think if you can make the set of adversarial examiners rich enough, then you can really be sure that the method is going to work. As I say, you know, this is your worst enemy. These adversarial examiners were not created by my worst enemies. <laughs> they were created by my graduate students. But I think, uh, you know, I think it's the point of trying to make it harder and harder, uh, you know, for you. Um, as I say, second point from Corey, uh, you, you want to find specific points of failure and keep hammering at it, um, which at the same time requires understanding the algorithms better, I would say, um, you know, I, I mean, I, my general belief is that if you can make, you know, I think in the long term, anything that you don't understand, you can break by this type of approach. If you understand it, you can start defending against it or fixing it so that you know how to, you know, that you can get it to, to succeed, I think. So I think you're right, the, you know, the, the two examples I've had are rather, you know, they're the first ones we came up with, but you'd like to develop it, yeah, precisely as you say, to encourage the adversary to explore as broadly, you know, as you can. You know, if you had a computer graphics data set that was big enough, representative enough, and all those factors, you'd like to explore them, but you'd have to sort of pin down which you know, learn the strategy or pin down which parts of the strategy are really going to hurt the algorithm. Okay. Um, so in terms of German open engineering, I think, you know, I would like to say that if a human can do it, then a computer vision algorithm can do it also, even if it's never going to show up in any of your data sets or any of your real world conditions, if it's there, if it fools the algorithm, and it's not going to fool a human, then you should be worried. Because I think also by having these types of attacks and defending against them, you're going to be moving towards algorithms that you can really, um, uh, really uh, approach for that. Um, any research on human performance in response to adversarial testing? Um, not that I know of for these methods, because basically for these methods, they're too easy. <laughs> Humans will not have any difficulty with these patch attacks at all. I mean, they would say they get the car, you know, they know what the object was and then they'd say, okay, there's the object and there's a little patch there and maybe it looks a bit like a painting of a fish or something. But I don't, you know, it's something I've thought about, but I, you know, would have to 
come up with cases where the attacks would be really hard to, you know, where the humans wouldn't get 100% correct. Um, yeah. Other issues, right, and adversarial examiners which use computer graphics, are they problematic because synthetic images are not perfectly realistic? I mean, my answer to that is computer graphics images are increasingly realistic, but also from human perception, you know, humans, we can switch from real images to computer graphics images easily. We have no difficulty doing that. So I think computer vision algorithms, if we want them to be capable of doing, you know, behaving rather like human vision, they ought to be able to do that too. So the ability to do domain transform is something that we should require of computer vision algorithms, you know, inspired by how humans can do it. Um, Another question I get more from the computer vision people was, I don't care about malicious attacks, so why should I care about these? And I say my main motivation isn't to defend against malicious attacks, um, uh, uh, but really to study the weak points of algorithms. Okay, so you thought the patch example, parakeet with the scoreboard being the background. Yeah, I think I mean, that's a good point. I mean, I think though in the setup here, the understanding is, at least for the deep network, is that there's just an object, you know, and the whole image or most of the image should be the object. I mean, you could certainly reformulate it so that the deep network thought that there was an object in the background and would have the task to detect the object and find the background, in which case, yeah, you, I, you know, your point would, you know, would be relevant. Um, so I'm interested to say you think it's a parakeet, but <laughs> but still, yeah, it's, at least it's a, you wouldn't think it's a real parakeet. You probably think, I'm, I would guess that it's a sort of a symbolic artistic parakeet. Okay, so moving on a little from this is um, now, it's partly building up to the compositional genital networks or what I'll call perhaps approximate analysis by synthesis. And here I give the game away is because I have a long-term belief that our, the vision ought to be solved by forms of analysis by synthesis. But then I have to publish my papers in computer vision conferences where everything is evaluated by uh, you know, standard performance measures on you know, BAD uh, data sets. So how can I manage to do that? Okay, so the challenge is for the types of models we're talking about. First, we have to get them so that they work as well as standard deep networks on those types of standard tests. I have a hope of getting them published at all. Then we have to show that they have advantages under other situations. So, that's what we were doing. We, we, you know, the other situations out of distribution for us was having occlusion. This happens very frequently in images. You will have data sets where the training doesn't have any occlusion or has very little occlusion, but you test it on images where there is where there are large amounts of occlusion and see how well performance goes. That is an example of out of distribution testing. Um, the second one is the adversarial examiners, the types of patch attacks that I brought up earlier. Those are tough types of attacks. They work really successfully against standard deep nets. How well are they going to work against these types of compositional generative networks that I'll describe? So why generative? Well, generative knowledge of, of the process Objects come from different views, can be occluded, there can be foreground, there can be background. There are many reasons for these things, I think. Um, and some of the CBM literature would have argued for this, ideas of naive physics and so on. Um, and, but, uh, and let me just make a few background comments on analysis by synthesis. Um, I think people are probably familiar with it in this audience computer vision people are usually, you know, only to a limited extent. So it's to formulate vision in terms of inverse inference, which 
you could consider now as inverse computer graphics, though at the time the ideas of analysis by synthesis started, uh, computer graphics was such a primitive state that nobody, <laughs> you know, it was not something that, you know, you'd even think of in this context. Um, so what does it require? It requires generative models that can render the complexity of the real world. Computer graphics is something that can do that these days. GANs perhaps increasingly capable of it. Um, so it requires that sort of process of generating the real stimuli. And secondly, algorithms which can invert the generative process. Now the first part is hard and so for um, 30, 40 years, you know, analysis by synthesis has been really difficult. It's now becoming a bit practical because the first part has been partially solved. But to invert the generative process is really difficult. There's a huge search problem there. So to detect a car, for example, you don't only have to search over the position and size of the car, but also the make of the car, because that's going to affect the appearance the 3D orientation, the color, the texture, whether the car is clean or dirty, the weather conditions, and a whole bunch of other factors that you can think about. So it's a very, very hard search problem to do. Now, the CGMs are a type of approximate analysis by synthesis. The generative models are defined on deep network convolutional feature vectors, not on the image intensities. So the advantage of this is that the feature vectors, because they're the final convolutional feature vectors, they don't care about details in the image which are not really needed for tasks like object recognition. Uh, you know, so to detect a car, uh, you know, standard analysis by synthesis would say, you know, you have to detect my car or Tommy's car or Professor Biden's car from particular angles. Whereas really, you only want to detect the car, you don't care about those details really. So if you use deep network features, that gives you a coarse description of the car, which means which and the features are invariant to details that don't matter. That also means that fairly simple generative models are sufficient. You don't need to learn very complex probability distributions unless you want to apply this to find detail tasks where you may need more properties of the image intensities. So simple generative models are sufficient to do it at this level, which means that learning them is not, you know, is possible and inference is also fairly straightforward using algorithms which are pretty similar to uh, deep networks. So see there's a question. Approximate generative models can it be formalized Biological plausibility. Well, I should appeal to theoretical, you know, neuroscientist experts, which I'm not really one. I have friends who are theoretical neuroscientists, <laughs> um, um, and but I and I think that's um, I think that's a challenge. I mean, the original idea of analysis by synthesis that David Mumford conjectured extremely boldly in 1991 was that you had feed forward and feedback connections and the feedback connections could generate the image which you'd compare to the, you know generate your guess of the image which you'd compare to the real image and then after that you would look at the differences and you would use feedback loops for it so there's certainly a big picture idea there that you could do um, i think formalizing it here you know, I, I, I'm certainly very interested in the possibilities of this, and I'd love to follow it up. Um, because if you think of doing it as approximate, it sort of throws different light on what David Mumford and other people are wanting to do. You know, you would start off by using the top levels to get the sort of the core ideas, you know, core idea structure, and then the details would go down in the bottom. So, um, I'd like, you know, I'd love to follow up on that. Um, but all I've got at the moment is sort of hand wavy arguments and intuitions, but to formalize it more, yeah, certainly something I'd love to do. Um, so now to go on to 
the fact, here is the motivation, and now go on to the occluders. So I'm, you know, I'm telling the story in sort of slightly non-historical way because, uh, you know, for some time I've been thinking that occluders are ways to really test current algorithms and challenge them. So, um, so the claim here is that deep networks don't generalize well to occluders. Um, and here you train them with not occluded data and here you see how their performance goes as the occlusion area decreases. And the performance goes down to 63% compared to 99.1% on if there's no occlusion. So, I mean, I admit this is slightly unfair because, you know, 10 years ago, we'd have killed to find an algorithm that could get anywhere like 63% <laughs> classification performance if there's 70% occlusion. But now we've been spoiled by deep networks. So, you know, now we're not satisfied with this anymore. Oh, I see your comment, Tommy. Thanks. Yeah, let's definitely follow yeah, up on that. And, you know, is this number good? Well, we did some experiments on this in COGSI 2019, and the argument is humans, you know, humans basically do perfect, you know, they do almost perfectly under these sort of situations, I think. Um, so now, um, uh, oh, was there a question here? Sorry, can I compare on utilizer points in the speech language domain? I think I'd rather delay that till later because I think they could apply to that, but I'm not an expert in speech or language, which means I have opinions and you shouldn't necessarily believe them. Um, but we can get back to that. So um, they don't, you know, so what if we train with augmented data? So this is a standard deep network idea. Okay, let's just throw more data at it. Let's throw more occlusions at it, throw it in here. So you put in five times as much data, which has occlusions in it, and it does improve, you know, in, in, in certain performance measures going from 63 to 80%. Okay, you know, that's quite a big jump. That's a gain. Um, and one Chinese student, when I gave part of this talk, he thought this was the take home message. <laughs> but my take home message was, was not really this. You know, it does improve. You've got more examples, but maybe again, like sort of certain aspects of deep networks, you're sort of maybe memorizing certain occlusion patterns and they're similar to the ones that you're going to see. Um, so anyway, but this would be the standard deep network, more data is going to fix the problem. So now go to what we did. So as I said, we take the deep networks part, the convolutional layers, and we eliminate the classification heads. So we keep the features. And sometimes when I'm in a joking mood, I say, I. I love the features of deep networks. I really love the features of deep networks, but I don't like the classifiers. <laughs> That's putting it a bit extreme, but the features are really, you know, the features are really good, but why not replace the classifier by a generative model? So the class of, so at the top of the deep network, you've got these bunch of really nice features, uh, you know, height, width, feature vectors, FP, and you can, and you can use that to train a generative model, you know, and these features, as I've said, are invariant to details about the image that you don't actually care about at the moment. You know, well, you don't care about for the task we're doing. So you replace the head by generative model, and I've really got to get a better picture for this, but the idea is that you have an object at the top right here, which would be, you know, a car or a vehicle or anything, and I should say right now that our work was originally done on vehicle classes and then generalized up to 100 objects. Um, and, and it's best working mainly on the vehicles um, for reasons I'll discuss. So you have an object, then you can generate different viewpoint. You can have class mis mixtures which correspond to different viewpoints. Um, you know, so this is like classic models. You recognize the object by having viewpoint one, viewpoint two, viewpoint three, viewpoint four. We're not telling the object model that because we're not giving that extra information. But what it does, and it's going to learn this sort of automatically, it's going to learn that for each object, there are several possible 
uh, sort of structure patterns of, of images, uh, you know, image features that are going to happen. You know, so if you look at a car from the front, you're going to see cars on the left and cars on, you know, cars on the left, cars on the right, and the window in the center. And if you look at it from the side, you're going to see a different type of pattern. So you could have a whole set of 2D models of objects um, for that. Okay, so you have those, and then they generate features. And in between the deep network features of the, these BMF kernels, which are sort of a bit like parts in quotations, because, you know, to say their parts is a little bit too strong, you know, they look like them and you can quantify them to some extent, but they're not perfect. But at least you've got a generative model, you select an object, you select, a, you generate a class mixture, you generate a structured pattern. Okay. And there's a bit of math here. I'll, I'll, I just put it up to say that the math isn't very complicated to discuss this in detail requires going over the paper and there's not really much time for that in this type of talk. But what you're essentially doing is that it's, uh, you know, replacing the top fully connected layers with a set of operations which are fairly similar mathematically, but have very different interpretations. Um, is a generative model just augmenting the convolutional features? I wouldn't call it augmenting them. It's sort of generating them which has some sort of big advantages. Um, if we're using a pre-trained CNN for features, aren't you worried this will ignore the relevant parts of the image that the network is trained to ignore? Um, we could be, except it, it doesn't really, that hasn't seemed to affect it at the moment. In fact, the features we're using are all, um, you know, trained, features. We don't train the low level features. We take them from something off the shelf. I have wondered about, okay, maybe you replace them by the sort of unsupervised convolutional features, which, you know, is a very hot topic at the time, at, you know, at this time, and, you know, hey, that actually might work better. I'm, I just haven't persuaded the student to try that out yet. Um, but, you know, we are relying on the deep networks to pick features that do the right thing. And the right thing here is classification for some of the tasks we're doing with this as well. It, you know, different features might well be better, but okay. So you replace it by the generator model, and then you learn the parameters by a combination of differentiating and clustering. You know, so when you're training a standard deep network, you have a loss function and you just do differentiation to, uh, you know, to train the weights. I mean, well, not just differentiation, because of course, you know, it's actually technically pretty difficult, but, you know, anyway, you, you do that conceptually. But here, we're also doing forms of clustering. We are essentially learning a dictionary of feature vectors that happen, which are the VMF kernels and which correspond roughly to parts. And we're learning these class mixtures. So when we're doing the learning, there's differentiation for estimating parameters here, but there's also clustering to estimate these things and those ones. I mean, that happens in some types of deep network architectures as well that I'm familiar with, uh, but it's not really standard. Um, a question about the take home thing. Well, we haven't got to the, uh, <laughs> to the take home point yet, um, but I'll get there in the slide. So you've got the generative model, and so it's got more internal structures than the deep network. It's got, it can represent spatial patterns. It's got some interpretability about the class mixtures and the parts. But certainly if you run this algorithm, it's not going to be very robust to occlude us. Uh, let me just say the explainability very quickly. So the VMF kernels resemble part detectors. Um, you know, these are images which would activate a particular kernel, you know, engine, wing, engine of airplanes, side of airplanes, etc., seats of bicycles. Um, now, of course, for someone who's been computer vision as long as I do, you know, you know that you can make things like this that look wonderful and they're cherry picked. These are not really cherry picked, and we can quantify these uh, because we did some annotations. So these VMF kernels do sort of correspond roughly to parts, but not 
as precise to parts as I'd like. Similarly, for the class mixtures, you can interpret them to some extent. And so, uh, you know, for bicycles, this is one class mixture, bicycle from the side. Another one is tandem bicycle, things like this. Another one is bicycle from these other views, etc. So there's some interpretability there, which is quite nice. But getting back to that point, okay, so now what do we do? Now to make it robust, we introduce occlusion as an outlier process. So, you know, this is a pretty standard idea in basic probability theory or statistics, you know, in Bayesian models. You have a generative model of the data, you could do inference on it, but then you say, hey, wait a moment, maybe the data was generated by is contaminated by something else. You know, a long time ago in the 90s, I co-authored a paper on robust PCA where you assumed that the data was generated by a Gaussian, which if it had been purely a Gaussian would give you PCA, but then you said, okay, and there's a probability some of it could have been generated by a uniform distribution, which gave you robustness. So the same idea, is, is put in here, and it's a very natural thing to do for a generative model. So we say that the image could be generated by one of the objects, and one of the viewpoints, etc. but there's a probability that the data could have been generated by an outlier process. An outlier process means that the feature vectors can come from what we call these occluder kernels, and those are basically anything in the data set. This induces you know, anything in the, any sort of background thing, anything that's not particularly the object. So this can be done with an outlier model, variable Z, which is just another variable to put in here that would have to be estimated to decide if you think the data has been generated by one of your object models from a viewpoint or whether it's been generated by an occluder. Um, how do the VMF kernels learn parts of the object? Is it supervised? No, it's not supervised. It's, um, it's just done by clustering. It relates to work we did several years ago called Visual Concepts, which we clustered and found it a bit hard to get <laughs> accepted in computer vision algorithms. But it's when you're training the network, uh, you know, as well as using differentiation to learn parameters, you are clustering to get a sort of a dictionary of feature vectors, which are the VMF kernels, as well as clustering to get the viewpoints. I should say part of that's non-trivial. The clustering happens with a mixture of spectral clustering and some other stuff as well, but basically, yeah, we're not using any supervision for this. Um, okay, question from Fernando de la Torre. Uh, the different viewpoints are learned from the different configurations of the same object. That's correct. Um, should the model additionally receive an input or learn where it is in the 3D space? Um, yeah, that is sort of slash future slash ongoing work because certainly with humans, you'd certainly expect to recognize objects by looking at from several views. And, you know, here we're just taking a few static images. So, with the CNNs, I, I would say that this is sort of work in progress. We've got 2D CNNs here, which have some nice properties, but there were certain, certainly limitations of them that I, I, I want to improve on. It's the basic concepts, I think, which are perhaps good. Um, what sort of weighting or confidence does occlusion element get? Well, that is something that is, you know, that is something that you specify. It's not something you learn because Think about it, you know, what you're trying to do here is you're doing out of, out of distribution learning, out, you know, you're going to test out of distribution, so you can't actually learn how much occlusion there's going to be because, you know, if you did, you know, you'd really have knowledge of that. So it's like a type of tolerance you get for the amount of contamination in the data where the contamination was the occluder. Um, if you're familiar with uh, Alexandra Madri's formulation of, uh, of the, you know, of a uh, min-max formulation for standard non-perturbative attacks is a little bit like that. You know, you want to minimize the energy, but you 
you know, you maximize over some transformation on the data and how big that maximization is, is the amount of robustness that you're putting into the model. And, you know, and that's a factor that you have to specify. And so roughly here, that's what you were doing here with the occlusion, et cetera. I mean, it's a starting point. You could consist more types of things there. Um, what types of classes is the class mixture modeling? You know, it's, it's roughly viewpoint changes. It isn't always that, as I said, it's not trained, it's not supervised. You know, it looks like that, but it's not perfect. You know, you'll get an airplane going one direction, you'll get an airplane pointing the other direction, they will be put in the same cluster. That's a limitation of the model at the moment. You know, as I say, I think the classes that we've got by clustering, both for the class mixtures and for the parts, they are interpretable up to a point. They're more interpretable than anything else we could check, but they're not, you know, they're not, they're not as good as what a human would get, uh, which is good. So I don't have to retire just yet. Um, okay, occlusion is an outlier process. Um, and then once you do that, then you can see that the models are going to become robust to occluders, but can also localize them. Uh, we did it originally on vehicles only, um, and then we extended it later on. Here's sort of examples on videos. So here, the occluder, this sort of Z variable, which decides how much the occluder is, you know, there's sort of a probability for that. And so for this image, it says, hey, we think this area here, the bar is an occluder, the head is an occluder, the tree is an occluder, et cetera. So this is because it's trying to predict the spatial pattern, and then it finds that some piece of the pattern don't look right, but they could be explained by the occluder process. So that is, um, you know, so that's a good, you know, so that, that helps, that's a good thing. Um, uh, so you can perform as well, the tables I left out, <laughs> partly because I, I must say I get so frustrated that we have to have tables in all our papers and when students send me a paper to review before they send it in I mean I must admit I glance at the tables but I'm far more interested in the ideas and I'll take it for granted that they're hard-working students so their table results are all good but basically what you're doing with this is you're getting performances about as good as a deep network if there's no occlusion but as the amount of occlusion goes up the performance is pretty good, uh, you know, and you're going up to about 90%, even under 70% occlusion. So, uh, you know, in comparison with what you get earlier, you're pretty, you're, you're pretty robust. Um, the results are best on the vehicles because, you know, the assumption here is that four viewpoints, four classes are enough to capture the viewpoints. And for objects like vehicles, that may well be enough you know, roughly. But as you start going to more complex objects, four mixture patterns are not really enough to capture it. So you still do reasonably well. And so if you scale up to 100 object categories, we had to do for the journal paper, you're still doing better than the deep necks with occlusion, but the performance is decreasing compared to how well we do with the vehicles. It's because we're trying to model the spatial patterns. And as I say, the four viewpoints sort of starts breaking down. Okay, so now this is the out of distribution stuff. And this is now a paper that I was upset was rejected by CPPR, which was now we said, okay, let's take the patch attacks. So if you remember the patch attacks are almost 100% successful on, uh, on deep networks. And so here is an example, VGG16 patch attack is almost 100% correct for targeted attack. Here's an example of the car with a few patches on it. Sparse RS is a, a later version. It's, it's different. It's got some clever things that were not in patch attacks. It's sort of followed up on it. It's got one patch. It also attacks it. But the CompNets, without doing any training at all, of an order of magnitude more robust. The reason for that is essentially, first, they, they know the structure of the object. You know, they, they've learned it roughly. And also they know that there can be outlier things which get rid of the patches. So it's fairly st straightforward that it should detect it, you know, be robust to it, but it's nice to see it's, it is so robust at the moment. 
Um, so the adversarial examiners are really effective against the deep networks, less effective against the patch attacks. But now I need somebody who really, who really doesn't like me to find uh, attacks that might exploit some of the weaknesses of the, uh, of the CGNs or persuade some of my students. So the motivator to detect limitations as we develop them, there are the very nice generative properties of this, which allow, you know, allow you to put in the clue the processes actually will allow you to do several different tasks with the same representation, which I haven't got into time to do. You can find boundaries to some extent as well and to find parts and to be robust for adversarial examiners without having any extra training. And as I say, it could be nice sort of ways of tying this into, into, you know, into, into neuroscience. But now, and this is going to be a little bit quick, um, I want to throw out one more piece, which was training to pass animals with weak trials, and I'd say with no annotated data. So, you know, I know, and I, I hear it a lot of CBMM, but, you know, humans learn vision in ways that are very different from machine learning system. And so here an infant could, infant could learn about a toy donkey, and here is an infant demonstrating it, you know, by seeing, touching it, and tasting it which means it could sort of produce the 3D model of it at some level, or even perhaps a precocious child could read about it in the archivist. So, you know, but, you know, an infant could explore what geometric configurations it could take, identify the key point where it bends and so on, and sort of could, you know, wild dimensional object, which it could render as a surrogate for visual development. So I'd love to hear anyone who buys that as a possible uh, relationship to cognitive science development. The best I've had so far was uh, Brandon Lake, one of Josh's students who seemed to sort of think it was roughly consistent. Um, but okay, so now, okay, going from that wild conjecture is what can you do? Can you take a computer graphics model of a horse or tiger, annotate its key points, or do you only annotate once, generate a large set of simulated images where the key points are known because you've annotated the model with a diversity of viewpoint, pose, lighting, texture, appearances, and background? Can you do that? Is that in some form a surrogate for human development? And if so, how well does it work? train a model for detecting key points on these simulated images. If you do this, you can get, you, your first finding is you can get detection of key points on the synthetic images, and they don't work terribly well on the real images, but they do well enough so that when you use them to start a self-supervised learning, they now perform pretty well. So here is animal passing, horses um, labeled on the horse model. You render the, render the horse with a whole lot of views, et cetera, um, and then you uh, test it. Uh, you test it on a data set where there was some annotations. The performance of that is like 80%. Uh, you start using these models you can go up to about 60% by doing a number of sort of clever tricks without any using any ground truth uh, real data at all. And you can move it up to about 70%. So you can actually detect key points quite well here without doing any super, you know, without any real supervision at all, just using a synthetic model and doing some domain transfer. And this has other nice properties. I'm realizing I'm going somewhat over time, um, and I'd rather rush this. Other, and I reason for that is I see nobody's asked any questions about this part of the work, so I can stop for minutes and just see if people have any questions on this, on this thing, or whether they would, uh, or whether, since I've talked for about an hour, whether people are saturated with listening to me and I should move towards wrapping it up and throwing things open for 
any other question. How could you generate examples in the brain without a graphics engine? Well, um, I appeal to Josh Tenenbaum, who gives talks about the physics simulator in your brain. <laughs> so I would refer to JB Tenenbaum private communication. I really don't know is the honest answer. Um, I mean, we know we can imagine objects in 3D in the brain, we can rotate them. Um, can we develop simulation? I'm really not sure. This reminds me, this is rather like a 1980s idea of how humans dream, <laughs> you know, if you remember the theories about that. Um, you know, Boltzmann machines, you train algorithms without any input, and then you'd train them, you know, and then you generate them without any input while you're asleep and, you know, and train on that. So I don't know. I mean, this, you know, this is wildly speculative. And, um, and I should say, if it's interesting enough, it's worth thinking about. If not, I don't know. But I mean, we can dream, you know, we can shut our eyes, we can imagine things. Neural mechanisms for that, I don't know, but potentially, uh, yeah. So it sounds like, Tommy, you think that's a bit too, yeah. Well, I'd say it's a conjecture, not an assumption, <laughs> I would guess. Uh, and maybe, uh, you know, maybe a conjecture too far. I mean, for publishing this in a computer vision thing, I think, in fact, we said nothing about cognitive science at all. We just said, look, it's nice. We can use computer graphics to generate things, and then we can train using that. You know, so that's good. Um, but since we've got cognitive science and you know, uh, you know, neuroscience experts here, I thought I'd like to throw it, you know, to throw it out and see whether this at all is possible. You know, because you know, right. You know, it's a big thing, but, you know, we can imagine things, we can do that type of stuff somehow, you know. So anyway, uh, what's the question about uh, synthetic in the horse case? Is it meant to guide the learning process or augment the network without any supervised data? Um, for me, the exciting thing was that you could really get good results on the real data without any graph truth annotations on the real data. The, the best performance though is if you combine it with the ground truth on the, on the real data, and then you move things up to, you know, from slightly below 80% up to 85%. Um, so, you know, I mean, I love the idea of not having to <laughs> train with any, you know, I would love the idea of trying to train with limited supervision and even almost no supervision, you know, partly to, you know, and then test on infinite supervision, I think. Might be hard to, to go beyond single objects, the scenes of objects when rendering a data set for pre-training, so that might be harder. Yeah, I mean, we've just done it with objects. I mean, there are things that, there's recent paper by Sanya Fiddler I think it's an ICLR that was using types of interpretable GANs in the rendering engine that sort of seemed to relate a little bit to this. I mean, very different, but I, I'm not fully enough a GANs expert at the moment to know how far you could go with these sorts of models of how, how much you could do the rendering. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure about it. You know, these are, you know, I think starting with images, you know, starting with objects, you know, that's a place to start. Possibly it would end here because you can't extend it, but, you know, starting is, you know, it's a good, seems a, perhaps a good place to start. Um, uh, right. So moving back, right. So here, yeah, so this was a question actually, oh, yeah, if you have the real data alone, about 79%, if you used a synthetic plus the label data, you moved up to 82.43, not a huge amount. But if you had the synthetic data by itself with this extra stuff and self-supervised training, you move up to 70.77. Um, 
you also found, you know, you could in principle scale this up to more categories. We didn't at the time, partially because actually to evaluate this, and this gets back to some of my complaints about computer vision data sets, we had to have some data set where there was ground truth for certain of the key points, and we could find that for horses and tigers, but we couldn't find it for, you know, we, um, we couldn't find it for sheep, we couldn't find it for mammoths or things like that, so we didn't do it on it, but I thought it could, it might work out, you know, anyway, I think in principle, it should apply. Um, we then thought, okay, since the, treat, the network's been trained so it can start moving from synthetic, the synthetic stuff to the real, then it can do forms of domain generalization. So if you run it on these types of things here, um, uh, it will work reasonably on these types of things as well without having to do anything much extra. So I think on this project, the idea was that if you had some synthetic data, uh, you know, and were able to do some form of domain transfer to real, as we're showing here, then that's got quite a lot of, um, you know, advantages from a computer vision perspective. The crazy wild conjecture, which I've only, I haven't actually dared to write down, uh, except, uh, you know, it's certainly not in the paper, would be whether humans can actually do these things, can simulate these things in their head well enough to train on them. But yeah, that's beyond it. So conclusion is, you know, going back to the beginning that, you know, AI vision has very big limitations compared to the human visual system. And, you know, a problem there is, you know, I think one reason for that is I, I think we're suffering a bit from the tyranny of data sets and the types of standard performance measures that we used, because although they're really good, you know, I mean, that's, that's taken us to the level and we shouldn't neglect them. It, it really, you know, it, it really favors certain types of approaches that have the ability to, you know, to learn the patterns in the, in the images and the data and the deep net seem to be wonderful at doing that, but perhaps we've failed to understand you know, to get deeper structure of the data, which is necessary to do sort of out of out of distribution tasks, or you know, or to uh, transfer to other domains, or to uh, you know, or to deal with the adversarial examiners, these tougher tests. And so I worry, and this happens to a lot of my graduate students and a lot of the computer vision people, is you just publish papers that make bigger and bigger improvements on standard performance measures but are not necessarily giving any real insight into, you know, are not really giving good insight into improvements. Um, and, um, you know, and when I remember when deep networks came along, first few years, you know, you made an improvement on a deep network or applied it to a new problem, your performance increase went up by 10 AP or some huge jump. And now you've got far more people with far more powerful computers strike publishing papers where performance has gone up one AP or something like that. And I feel it's uh, perhaps a use, you know, it's, we're not really a good use of resources, you know, and some of those findings on, even on a big data set like ImageNet may not transfer over to other situations. So I think we really need to have, you know, in a computer vision, perspectives and machine learning to have far tougher evaluation algorithms because also I think that will show up, you know, that will test the current deep networks better. I mean, maybe they will survive them. I'm guessing that probably they won't and will require modifications. But if we do that, then we'll start developing algorithms that really can work, you know, towards the level of human performance. And so for me, the compositional general networks were a type of thing that we're doing and we're performing them better on these tougher challenges at the moment. But as I say, there are limitations to that that I'm only too well aware of that we'd like to improve. Uh, the only annotate once again is, you know, is slightly orthogonal to this, but 
relates to the same point. You'd like to be able to have algorithms that could transfer from one day and range to the other that rely on far less training, et cetera, and so on. Um, so a question about yeah, annotating once. Yes, you annotate a single instance of an object class. So you go to the computer graphics model, you go into the Blender code, and so once you've done that, you've annotated on the sort of the 3D model there, then you can generate it under all sorts of different conditions and get a very large amount of data that you can use. It is tough. I mean, I think what we try doing, you know, the natural idea is you try and make the images um, realistic. You try and generate the images to make them look more and more realistic and then you use those, and that didn't work. What we found was actually what seemed better was that you had a whole lot of variability in lighting and texture patterns and so on, and you used that. Why? We're not really sure, but the intuition is that really, the, that if you did that, you, you focused the algorithm on sort of properties of the object like the edges you know, the boundaries, because the boundaries of the objects are really, of a computer graphics object, they're fairly similar to the boundaries of real objects. The texture stuff, the appearance may be different. But so trying to make the generative models too realistic may actually be hurting you or certainly hurt us when we're doing that project. It relates a little to the approximate analysis by synthesis idea in the comp gen, gen nets, is that, you know, in a way, you don't want to have too much of the details of the images because they're difficult to do. They may be irrelevant. They may distract you, you know, at least to do the types of tasks that computer vision are doing at the moment. They're fairly coarse level tasks. You know, later on, when we want to do fine level tasks, then maybe we need to go into those, but we may not need them, need them yet. Uh, should we crowdsource the problem of detecting failures of existing algorithms, let people upload images where systems fail, crash logs of airplanes? I mean, you can certainly do that. Um, I, and, uh, you know, but that's sort of, and you know, and it would work probably, but, it, you know, it's a brute force thing. And even, you know, the numbers of, it scales with the number of, images and number of annotators, you're not really going to ever get to a, you know, to a, you're not really going to get to a combinatorial number that way, if you see what I mean. You know, you've got a billion people, you've got, you know, you know, you've got a billion people, you show them a million images that they can look at, you know, that's a big number, but it's still not a combinatorially big number necessarily, I think. But of course, I'm you know I'm I'm pushing a particular viewpoint here, which may not be a uh, you know may not be a you know, uh, and uh, I may be pushing it too extremely at the moment. Um, anyway, so this is on the you know this is on the occlusion. I think that human perspective, you know, the human challenging the algorithms to do the humans can do really tougher performance tasks you know, working out systematically what humans are capable of compared to what machine vision systems can do, challenging the machine learning systems to do them, modifying them in the ways that I've suggested here um, would be ways to, uh, you know, to improve the AI side of vision and probably also the, the cognitive side as well. So that's it, I guess, at the moment. Uh, I've gone over time, there's a whole bunch of references here um, gosh, and I should have put photographs of people and I should have, um, I should have acknowledged grants, et cetera, but fortunately all those are in the papers, et cetera. So maybe I should just stop here and, um, and cause I've after all gone way over time, I think, um, stop here and see if there are any, any more questions or, uh, that people have at this stage. Very good. Yes. Uh, let's see whether there are more questions, but there were quite a lot during your talk. It was great. And um, I hope we can start some collaboration from it.
it will be great, even better. Yeah. yeah, we certainly have to do that because I I think there's some very you know definitely some interesting things here and you know there's a lot of yeah, yeah. anyway yeah, absolutely <laughs> I should say that that's good well thanks for listening I mean I put a lot of material here as you can see by the references but I think the big picture and thing here was more than the you know the sum of the individual components. But I think the questions were really interesting and stimulated and uh, yeah, it would be definitely wonderful to, uh, to carry on and uh, see, you know, see if joint projects can come, come out, from, out from this. That's great. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Alan. It was okay, well, great to have you. Me. And uh, yeah, I hope everybody enjoyed it as much as I did, which is a lot. So uh, let's do it again at some point. Yeah, hopefully absolutely. Soon. And hopefully in person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay, Tommy. Well, great to see you again. And uh, yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah. So, Until bye -bye. the next week for this we'll seminar. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Bye, Alan. Bye.